Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 68 of the podcast. It's the 19th of April, 2017, as I record this intro. And in this week's episode, Terry DeMarco and I chat about unschooling and technology. It's a big concern for a lot of unschooling parents and one that comes up pretty regularly in listener questions on the Q&A episodes, so I wanted to devote a whole episode to the topic. Terry and I chat about her journey with technology, uh, fears that can come up and ways to examine them, some of our aha moments, ways we can engage with our children, and so much more. I'm really excited to share this episode with you guys. I've got a bit of a long intro this week, so I'm going to skip my personal update, but I do want to send a big thank you to everyone who has chosen to support the show on Patreon. And welcome to new patron Remy Bycroft. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. You guys inspire me. And I love that you're helping me share unschooling information with anyone who wants to explore ways to live this wonderful lifestyle with their family. And if you'd like to support the show, even for as little as a dollar a month, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And instead of a quote this week, there's something I want to talk about before we get into the interview. Uh, you guys may have noticed over the many years that I've been writing and talking about unschooling that I'm not big on sharing studies. There are a few reasons for that. One reason is that data can be sliced and diced and presented in many different ways to support whatever we want to say. This one is near and dear to my heart because at one point in my former career, I was a data analyst and I dug deep into data to try to answer questions. I even ran a data warehousing project for a while. I know how thin the thread can be that ties data and conclusions together. Case in point, there are many studies that support both sides of the technology issue. One that says tech use should be limited and others that say there aren't any negative effects. Studies that say violence and entertainment increases aggressions, and others that say there is no effect. That said, it can be interesting to read studies, to think about the group being studied, how it was conducted, what they concluded, and why. Not as, quote, the answer, but as more information to incorporate into our worldview. For example, it's very rare that a study is done on a group of unschooling children. And we know that unschooling children, children who are free to make real choices every day, often behave differently compared to their conventionally schooled and parented peers. So to take the results of conventional studies at face value is already suspect. That reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from Carol Black. She wrote, Collecting data on human learning based on children's behavior in school is like collecting data on killer whales based on their behavior at SeaWorld. The children in these studies are conventionally parented and schooled children. There is a logic to what they see in those studies. Yet, it's a logic that often does not apply to unschooled children's lives. Experienced unschooling parents are sharing what life with children looks like in the open ocean, not the tank. Another reason is that sharing studies implicitly endorses our cultural tendency to value quantitative data, that is numbers and statistics, over qualitative data, thoughts and motivations. That studies with numbers to prove their conclusions hold more value than those based on personal experiences. I bought into that bias for many years, consoling myself with the understanding that unschooling parents very rightly avoid measuring and testing their children. And then I came across something that Brene Brown, a qualitative researcher, shared in her book, Rising Strong. It's a quote from an editorial written by Anne Hartman in Social Work. She wrote, uh, This editor takes the position that there are many truths and there are many ways of knowing. 
Each discovery contributes to our knowledge, and each way of knowing deepens our understanding and adds another dimension to our view of the world. For example, large-scale studies of trends in marriage today furnish helpful information about a rapidly changing social institution. But getting inside one marriage, as in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, richly displays the complexities of one marriage, leading us to new insights about the pain, the joys, the expectations, the disappointments, the intimacy, and the ultimate aloneness in relationships. Both the scientific and the artistic methods provide us with ways of knowing. Brene Brown went on to explain that, Today, I proudly call myself a researcher storyteller because I believe the most useful knowledge about human behavior is based on people's lived experiences. So that was an aha moment for me. Our stories are valuable. Sharing our experiences adds meaningfully to the collection of knowledge around human behavior, specifically children's behavior. And that's important. So now I'm even less inclined to share the quantitative studies that pass through my days. And yet another reason is that I don't want to perpetuate our reliance on, quote, experts. I think it prolongs our inability to think for ourselves. So many of us have learned through our own conventional school experience that what we think is irrelevant. It's what the experts think that matters. So our first step when an issue arises is to look around for an expert to tell us the answer. But as we've realized looking back at our school careers, being given an answer, even if it is it is a quote, right one, does not necessarily necessarily lead to understanding. It's the difference between content and context. (laughs) And that, of course, brings to mind another one of my favorite quotes. It's from Maria Popova, the creator of brainpickings.org. She wrote, we live in a world awash with information, but we seem to face a growing scarcity of wisdom. And what's worse, we confuse the two. We believe that having access to more information produces more knowledge, which results in more wisdom. But if anything, the opposite is true. More and more information without the proper context and interpretation only muddles our understanding of the world rather than enriching it. This so concisely distinguishes between schooling and unschooling. See, at school, learning is all about remembering those pieces of information so that you can put them on a test end of story. In contrast, unschooling parents value the context and the connections that surround that piece of information and cultivate a learning environment for their children where the why and the how are just as important as the what. Again, tank and ocean. As parents embracing unschooling, it's so important to develop the ability to think critically for ourselves, to analyze the context, not just the content, to ask ourselves, is this true for us? Just as we examined the beliefs handed to us around learning and academics and chose unschooling as our family's learning lifestyle, it's important to take that same critical journey through the conventional messages we're being given surrounding technology around any issue over which we find ourselves conflicted. Is this true for us? And then trust yourself. Even if what you see unfolding in your unschooling lives flies in the face of what conventional experts are saying, or chances are you'll be thrown for a loop every time a new article or study purports to support the conventional messages. Or, as it's been referred to in unschooling circles, periodic unschooling panic disorder. That's why I personally shy away from the term expert and use the term experienced instead. I enjoy sharing my family's unschooling experience with anyone who is curious to learn more. I'm happy to share my unschooling perspective on things. Yet, at the same time, I want to encourage you to think for yourself. Don't take my experience at face value and try to shoehorn it into your lives. Your context, your family is different than mine. So while the principles stay the same, what it looks like day to day may be different. But what I hope is that you use the experiences and information shared by me and many others on the podcast to widen your lens and help you see new possibilities. 
And to help with that, consider the concept of beginner's mind. Zen K. Blanche Hartman describes it as a mind, quote, that is innocent of preconceptions and expectations, judgments, and prejudices. Beginner's mind is just present to explore and observe and see things as it is. She thinks of it as the mind that faces life like a small child, full of curiosity and wonder and amazement. And we only need to look at our unschooling kids as a shining example of beginner's mind in action. So today, let's approach the topic of technology with an attitude of openness and curiosity. Let's choose to release our preconceptions and expectations and just explore the possibilities. And with that, let's get on to the interview with Terry. Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca, and today I'm here with Terry DeMarco. Hi, Terry. Hi there. Hello, hello. I was lucky enough to meet Terry in person last year at the Childhood Redefined Conference in New York. And when I decided I wanted to do an episode focused on technology, I knew she would be a great person to chat with. We've got a lot to talk about. So to get us started, Terry, can you share with us a bit about you and your family and how you discovered unschooling? Yeah, sure. Um, So I live outside of Boston in Massachusetts. Um, And when my sons were, I have twin sons um, who are now 10 and a daughter who is eight and a husband. Um, And we used to have a cat, but we no longer do. Um, But when my sons were preschool age, um, we had investigated homeschooling them because we weren't quite sure what we were going to do. And we lived really close to Sudbury Valley School the original one in Framingham, Massachusetts uh, Mm -hmm. at the time. And I looked into that and I kind of got scared away when someone said, yeah, but what about math? Um, (laughs) And so I kind of set that aside and decided to look into other options. Um, And then we happened to move the uh, weeks before my sons were about ready to start kindergarten. And we happened to move to a town called Newton, which is one of the best school districts in Massachusetts. And so we decided to give school a try, which I think for us, we kind of needed to do. Um, And after kindergarten, we pretty much recognized that um, school was not going to be great for our family, um, for my husband or I and for the kids. Um, And, you know, this my sons didn't have a good time. They had different issues there. But um, so we kind of knew we needed to come up with another plan or a plan B. And we went to an unschooling conference in New Hampshire in April of 2013 that lasted about five days. And I think the third day in, my husband looked at me and said, so the kids aren't going back to school, are they? (laughs) I looked at him and I said, no, they are not. So uh, we were pretty convinced that we had no idea what was going to be in our future. We just knew that school really couldn't be. Um, And we unenrolled our kids right when we got back. Um, But, you know, when we sat there and really thought about it, for us, we looked at what we were both successful in in our careers. Um, I was in technology sales. My husband is a software engineer. um, And neither of us were formally trained in our career of choice and what we did successfully and and were able to make um, money at. And we both loved what we did. um, And we recognized that, you know, if we learned that on the fly and kind of unschooled ourselves, um, to be kind of at the top of our game and our, you know, our, each of our respective careers, then, you know, why couldn't our kids do that too? And the one thing that I got a great example of is my husband works in his passion. And if you've ever heard of people who work in their passion, they would do the job whether they got paid or not. And he's mm-hmm. one of those. Um, I was not. <laughs> so um, I was really good at what I did, but it really took a toll on me because it wasn't my passion. Um, And I figured that if we could give our kids the ability to, number one, know their passion and then the opportunity to either work in it or work to support their passion, um, that we would be ahead of the game and our kids would live a much happier life than many of the adults that I see around here in the Boston area. Um, So, uh, you know, kids never went back to school and we dove in headfirst um, and uh, it's been a wonderful choice and something that um, we look back on and know that it was the right thing to do and it's changed our lives forever. So we're pretty excited about it. That's really awesome. I love that uh, story. And I love the way you, you said um, you want to help your kids to know their passion um, 
and, and work, work in their passion or work to support their passion. Because I think that's such a great way to, to look at it. You know, just because somebody's interested in something doesn't mean they have to, you know, work in that or, or that they should be earning their income, you know, through that particular passion, choosing to keep it, you know, as, as your hobby, as your hat passion and choosing other ways to, um, get an income, um, to support it is, is still a great way of, of looking at it. Right. Right. And I think, you know, if you do, if you have a passion that you're supporting through what you do, you never take on all of the stress of that job, right? Mm -hmm. You, you know, that it's a means to an end. So you probably work at that job at the best possible balance, um, you know, being able to kind of do well, but never take on the stress of, um, the, the actual work of it. Right. Um, and I, you know, I happen to be an older mom. I had my kids when I was 39, my first kids. Um, and, you know, and I see many friends here in their 40s who, you know, are trained as doctors, lawyers, you know, huge, you know, college bills. Right. Mm -hmm. And they would never have done that job you know, in looking back. And I think they're kind of at a loss in their, you know, 40 plus life recognizing that, you know, they now have a mortgage, they have all these commitments that they can't make a shift in their, their career path because they've essentially cemented their feet. Um, and I, you know, and I think that that's taken a toll on their, um, happiness. Um, and, uh, I'm really happy that we, have had some ability to kind of shift ourselves. And because mm -hmm. my husband works in his passion, he never feels that way. I mean, yeah. he seriously loves, you know, sometimes there's things at work that are, you know, not fun, but in general, the work he actually does writing software, he gets excited about to this day. And I've known him 17 years and it just lights him up. So I love watching it. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, when it comes to technology, the conventional term that gets thrown around a lot, and we hear, we all hear it a lot, is screen time, right? Yeah. And I personally don't like the term for a couple reasons, and I think I've spoken before on the podcast about that, but I'm interested to hear your take on the term. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I think as humans, we, you know, it's our nature to categorize things because I think number one, especially if it's something we might fear, it's easier to lump it together and, and just kind of put it off to the side. Um, and parents have historically demonized stuff that their kids do, right? You know, the whole rock and roll and, you know, the, what are those long hair mm -hmm. kids into? Um, but, you know, and for conventional parents, I think that, you know, saying screens as a, you know, mo a mono name um, absolves them of looking further into what's actually going on. They can kind of sit with their fear and not really have any responsibility to kind of, you know, peel the onion on that at all. Um, mm -hmm. But unschoolers, um, you know, we're already doing something unconventional. So I think it's incumbent upon us um, to look more closely at what that means. So when, you know, if I see the conventional world say the term screens, I, I generally won't call them on it. Um, you know, I'll just say my piece with what I think is a worthwhile way to look at it. But if it's mm -hmm. an unschooler saying screens, I'm certainly going to peel the onion and, and kind of come at it saying, well, what exactly do you mean? Is it television? Is it iPads? Is it um, computers? Is it video game consoles? Is it virtual reality systems? Right. I mean, there's so many things that um, we might use. Um, and uh, and I, I think that whenever we have a fear, we have to acknowledge the reality of the fear that that's just unschooling. That's part of the de-schooling process that we all have to go through. Um, we have to break it down to know exactly what's causing us the fear. And then we have to decide if it's real, if it's caused by society or influences outside of us, or, you know, if it's something we actually need to fear, you know, that that's possible too. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not sure in my experience that many of my fears when I first have them have a lot of meat to them um, once I kind of unpack them a bit. So, um, you know, I, there is, you know, there's, <laughs> we live in a world where kids are not really respected so much. Um, and I think that we have this common wisdom in our, at least here in the U S um, that kids can't be trusted. You know, they can't be trusted to self-regulate. They can't be trusted to be responsible um, with 
um, things, with ideas, with, you know, time. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure that that's correct, but, you know, parents often step in and try and control or judge their kids' time or monitor their time, believing that they need to, you know, have systems in place to force the right behaviors. Um, so I think that when we start talking about, um, you know, screen time, right, you know, they, that's kind of the way people attack it. But, uh, you know, I bristle when I hear about earning screen time or losing screen time because, you know, it to me, it, it looks like a reward and punishment system. Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of don't view technology in any way as something that should be held as a carrot <laughs> because it kind of seems <laughs> like, you know, well, you have to do all the stuff you don't like for a long time. And then at some point in time, you get to have this, you know, this benefit or this reward of doing something fun, which is television or computer or video game. And I, you know, I, it seems to me that all learning should be fun. And we unschoolers know that play is how kids learn, um, that inherently in play is fun because if it's not fun, kids don't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we shouldn't dangle screen time or screens over kids' heads at all. Um, and when I hear that coming in the in-schooling conversations, it just reeks of conventional ideas, right? It just, you know, it means that we're letting some external influence um, control us when in fact we should just be looking at our kids and seeing what they're actually doing and trying un to understand what value they see in it. And I get it. I mean, my um, one of my sons, you know, watched shows from beginning to end numerous times, right? You know, like the seasons. Mm -hmm. And one yeah. of them was Total Drama Island, right? And this is a real, it's essentially a cartoon of the reality show Survivor, right? Uh -huh. And so it's just, a, you know, it's an odd thing, right? And I never could quite understand what he got out of it. And then I sat down with him. And what he loved is the competition and the challenges that were in it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so when he, he went from that to watching cooking challenging show challenges, you know, like um, Chopped or Guys Grocery Wars, you know, the different types of challenges shows. And he just yeah. loves anything that's a competition. So to him, Total Drama Island had nothing to do with the reality show aspect of Survivor or that whole idea. It was really mm -hmm. about the competition. And so I could really respect that because, you know, as a kid who is – does a lot in gaming and, and plays a lot of console video games. Um, you know, he loves the competition of these games. And for him, it's just, it's just how people attack and strategize about how they're going to win and how they spend their time and where do they go first and all that stuff. And so that's a very different piece of learning than I think you might see if you didn't take a look. Right. Um, I can yeah. judge it and say, Oh, who would watch survivor? <laughs> Cause I never would have. <laughs> right. <laughs> But that's not what he was getting out of it. Um, so, uh, but, you know, to come back to the question, I think at a minimum, unschoolers need to be very clear about what they mean when they say screens. And that means they have to break it down. Um, mm -hmm. And they have to figure out what's important to their family. And then how each one of these systems, you know, number one, is part of play. And number two, can be how it can be used um, to augment learning. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I think I, I'll talk about it later, but I think you had produced a mind map of your son, Joseph and his mm -hmm. technology learning that yep. he had done at one point. And I mean, that I've done that with my son, my sons, and it is amazing. The side effect learning that happens when on the, with on any technology, but the computer has been probably our main, um, screen, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does yeah. that answer your question? Yeah, you dove into that really nicely. Because I find, um, you know, when somebody's using most often, not all the time, but most often when somebody uses the term screen time, it's very derogatory. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always, they're always looking down on it. Mm -hmm. But when I see it used, you know, like you said, you know that they haven't taken the time to look further and and absolutely we all have that fear right we've all we've all processed through that fear um or we're in the middle of it but 
it's that whole, um, like, like you said, that's how we're going to learn I, all those things that you learned about your son and competition. And for me, uh, Joseph and stories, and it just means so much more, um, if you can dig into it a bit and see actually what it is that they're doing and what they're getting out of it. And, and, uh, I think that's just a huge piece being able to recognize our fear and say, okay, and, but taking that next step to dive deeper into it and, and just be curious about it. Right. Right. Curi that's where I started. I was just so curious about what Joseph found so interesting right. and engaging about these, about the games that he was playing. The same thing you did with your son and watching that show. And it's right. not like sitting them down to interrogate them, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> because and I then think, they know, you know all of us are, a lot of us who come to this life tend to have been peaceful parents. So they may, we might mm -hmm. have come from the attachment parenting background. And, and I say that just because we're, we all generally are pretty attached to our children. Like our kids are really mm -hmm. attached to us. Like we have good attachment. And when we have bad energy about something, we don't have to say a word and our kids know. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So, I mean, I... It truly required me to not, I always say that I minimize myself and I don't minimize mom. I minimize mm -hmm. my attitudes or my agendas. <laughs> right? yes. And I think that it's really important to do that because if I sat next to my kid or if you sat next to Joseph or, you know, Lizzie or anyone and had like a kind of like a, Ugh, so what is this all about? They, you don't have to even say that and they aren't going to show you. Right. Mm -hmm. They're going to be somewhat on edge. They won't be in their flow because they're picking up a negative energy. And, yeah. I, you know, and I recognize I see that sometimes on the forums in which we participate, you know, that the, just the terminology is very pejorative. And mm -hmm. if that terminology is what people have chosen to use to describe a problem, then that agenda likely is coming through to the child. And the older the child is, uh, the more able they will be to separate from you to not show you what they're doing right yep exactly and and you know just put yourself in that situation for a moment if somebody comes you know and we all can because we've all had a family member or a friend come and question our unschooling choices you know and where we're feeling defensive because the attitude with which they're asking right. um is already uh, you can already see their agenda behind it and we feel defensive. So imagine just recreating that kind of atmosphere with your child. You're not going to learn um, anything because they're just, remember how flustered you are trying to answer the question the first few times, right? When you're just choosing it and you're not quite sure uh, what's going on or how to answer those more direct questions. Right. Your child's going to feel that same thing. Oh, geez, mom's like quizzing me about this. Um, I don't know what's going to make her happy. Um, or I don't want to share that part of me because, because I'll be devastated if she judges it negatively. Right. You know, there's so many things that go and emotions that will go through their head that you can't get, um, a, a real connected, uh, conversation going. Um, so that was a big thing for me. Like you said, I can, I love that, um, term, you know, minimized, um, minimized your agenda or your, uh, feelings about it. I, I, I would talk about it, about being open and curious, you right. know? So yeah, minimizing that part of it, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm fearful or I don't know what's going on. So I'm going to explore, but yeah, you have to get rid of, um, that other, that negative piece because it can impact, uh, what's, what's going on, um, as you're exploring and chatting with them and, and it can even stop you from seeing things because it's a filter you put in front mm -hmm. that you're already judging things before it gets to your mind to connect with other pieces, you know, even if you're just observing. Oh, right. It's fascinating. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, we should bias move. is real, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great. Um, so one of the first steps in pulling apart and examining the technology issue is recognizing all the learning that is happening and all the joy and fun. So that's what we were talking about, getting to that open and curious mm -hmm. um, 
attitude to start to be able to see all this. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what your journey with this issue has looked like. Sure. So um, I had a an interesting awakening to technology initially when my kids were still in school, you know, we had, we had just, I think when they were six, put a computer into the family room, um, just to kind mm-hmm. of investigate and, you know, look at Minecraft, I think at the time, I um, mean, you know, the kids were interested in it. I think Cole would play on it and be most interested at the time. Um, and while he was in school, he started asking for play dates with all these kids that he was not friends with. Right. And mm-hmm. but he specifically wanted to go to their houses because they had gaming consoles. Ah. Like, you know, this is not even think, something that I had quite figured out, you know, hey, would we have Xbox and PlayStation and all these things in our yeah. house? You know, this is, <laughs> I was still very much in a conventional thought. Um, and, you know, when I thought about it, I said, you know, I ho- I so want to make sure I have a house where my kids want to hang, you know, mm-hmm. and to to want to play here and where other kids want to come as opposed to my kids feeling that they aren't getting something here and wanting to go somewhere else, especially when it's someone that I have no real connection with. I mean, these are not, they weren't traditionally friends of his. They were just kids in his class that happened to have a gaming console. Uh And so, you know, by, by kind of coming into this with slightly of a, of a limiting mindset, right. I don't think we were really strong in our limits at that point. But just having that created that situation, I had an unintended consequence, right? My son was willing to go play elsewhere to get his name met. Um, And that by far was something that I had said when I became a mom, I never wanted to have happen. I wanted to make my house a welcoming place where the kids wanted to come to as opposed to be the one where, you know, they wanted to leave and go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So um, once the kids left school and uh, we immediately bought laptops. And they were on Minecraft uh, pretty much nonstop all day. Um, And we dove in, you know, as many of the unschooling forums talk about, you know, you kind of can step into it a little bit. Well, we certainly did not. Um, We went right in. And uh, what I is, um, I guess, hard as it might have been for my husband and I, I think it was great for us because it forced us to really de-school our attitudes about technology fast. Um, And, you know, we had to recognize that life was going to be dominated. Our first year of unschooling, at least, was going to be dominated by technology, right? By Mostly by computer at that time. We didn't have many other um, things to use. Um, but I immediately started playing with them, right? So I got mm-hmm. on Minecraft and I played with them. And I can't tell you how fun it was. Like, I love Minecraft. I think it is one of the best applications in the world. I play it by myself. I play it with my kids. You know, we play on servers. We play in so many different ways. Um, And I got to see what my kids loved about it. Um, And so I immediately could understand their point of view. Um, And Mm -hmm. I had no problem with it. Like, you know, there were certainly other things that I then had done school. Like they learned about Minecraft through YouTube. Right. So, Um, they would go online and they'd watch Sky or they'd watch, you know, who else? I mean, at the time, I think Stampy, Long Nose. Um, And, you know, there was swearing in these YouTube videos, right? So now not only do I have, you know, my kids on computers, they're on these YouTube channels. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, and they're listening to all these words and we, you know, whatever. And they'd start, you know, picking up the words. And so I decided that I just use it as a great opportunity to dialogue about swearing and, yeah. you know, it wasn't anything in our house that we disallowed. Um, I would t- I'd guide my kids and say, hey, if you use these words outside of the house, it is likely that you will um, have people look at you askance. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people are really mad. If you don't want to make people mad, you know, you might want to just be really aware of, you know, where you're using these words and how you're using it. So, you know, I think for the first three months, they probably swore all the time and it was kind of funny. Um, And then they got past their need to do it, and it really kind of mellowed out. Um, And then my son, when we had people here or when we were out, he would just bleep himself when he wanted to swear. So he would be talking, and he'd go, bleep. And it was (laughs) quite funny. Um, But I loved it because they, number one, at age six, had a real awareness of the fact of how to handle these types of things that, my gosh, you know, I I think most parents would say, your kids swore at six, you know, and they'd be appalled. Mm -hmm. Um, But they had a very mature attitude about it. And um, I was really impressed. And that actually was a great lesson for me in recognizing that kids are really capable of handling a lot of mature subjects at young ages. 
Um, yep. And they just need guidance. They need someone to normalize it for them. They need someone to help them understand any pitfalls or, you know, or quicksand they might end up in. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's their choice. You know, I don't disallow it, um, but it's their choice then. Um, and in general, they respect me. I respect them. And so they usually take what I say, um, you know, as something important because I don't I don't say no very often. Right. So um, mm -hmm. when it's something where I'm really like, hey, this is kind of important. Let's talk about this. They generally know that it probably has more weight than most other things. Um, so, um, you know, as I said, Ed and I had to de-school some of that. We also kind of gave up strict bedtimes at the same time. I mean, I say we dove into unschooling, we dove into radical unschooling, <laughs> um, <laughs> and because they were having so much fun, it was really hard to find end times. And I tend to go to bed early. So we kind of dealt with that. We had to deal with the fact that they'd be laughing and screaming in the middle of the night and waking us up, you know, well, geez, okay, now we have to talk about how we have to respect others in the house. You know, in my mind, these are all just amazing um, opportunities for dialogue and for learning. So, you know, as much as it was a little bit of a pain for a number of months, you know, luckily I'm at home with them. So if I don't get a good night's sleep, it's not the end of the world. You know, my other, my husband, maybe that's not the case. Um, but we were able to work through a lot of these issues. Um, and uh, so, you know, we we saw that. And then, you know, I think we've already talked to this, but I just learned to look at my kids whenever I would have a fear about technology or anything like that. I looked at my kids and I sat down and played with them or watched them. Right. And um, mm -hmm. and the nice part is that they love it when I sit and watch. So. Um, for our family, for the inner, I call them concentric circles, right? For the inner concentric circle of family, we were good and solid on our use of technology. Um, you know, as we started expanding out to family and friends, you know, the other concentric circles, it took longer for us to kind of uh, be comfortable with the fact that our kids were on technology and computers or gaming, uh, games, whatever. Um, for, you know, a good portion of their day. And we've, we lost friends because of it. Um, we have had homeschooling families not want to come to our house because they don't allow technology. Right. Um, yep. and even if my kids chose not to use the technology while those kids were here, all of their discussions would be about gaming, right. Or about something they saw in Minecraft or something they saw in a YouTube video. And so we had to recognize that, Hey, you know, we're kind of in this space where technology is very free here. Um, and that kind of sets us slightly apart from many of the other homeschoolers locally. So yep. we had to kind of recognize some of that. Um, but I, I think in general, I, I am, extremely happy that my kids have taken to the um, the technology that they have because the amount of learning that we've done in the four years that they've been doing this is um, probably well beyond anything they would have gotten in school, as we all know. Um, mm -hmm. And it's sparked interests that I could never have anticipated. Um, you know, one son was really interested in the Japanese language because he was really interested in anime in anime and he was really interested in just, you know, attack on Titan, different games on Roblox. And so he started speaking Japanese words and he still knows a ton of Japanese words just because he was into these YouTubers who really were into anime. Um, yeah. And you just see all these connections being made that uh, I, you know, how would you ever anticipate that they'd have an interest in any of this? Um, so I know I that's, that is one of the most amazing things. And that's kind of what sparked me to uh, make that original, you know, kind of map of the things that I had seen Joseph get into right after right. in those first six months or so that I, that I paid attention instead of limiting <laughs> yeah. and, and involved like your point about playing with them. That's so, so important. Um, being just being with them so that you can see what's going on. Anyway, your Japanese things reminded me um, years ago, Joseph and I were watching some um, 
I don't know if it was E3, but it was some gaming convention or, or, and uh, they were interviewing somebody in Japanese and, and they had the uh, subtitles up and he was telling me where they, they got them wrong. Oh my <laughs> gosh. How funny. I was like, what? <laughs> Jeez, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, it, it's, they, when they're interested, it is, you, you, it, you're just amazed by how quickly they learn. Um, what comes across their path. And like you said, you could, we could never predict or even try to put, um, you know, our, our agenda or our, you know, a, a framework of what they, we think they should learn in front of them is just so much smaller than what they actually do, isn't it? Well, right. And I think, you know, um, I, I always, you know, I think because, so and even in the unschooling community, I always kind of chuckle at this, but you know, I, there's always families who value certain types of learning, right? You know, they talk about their Mm -hmm. kids in the library and the books, or they talk about being in nature and being outside. And, you know, for those of us who have kids who are into technology, we don't tend to talk about it as much because, you know, it's, it's judged so frequently by everyone as being, you know, not the best way to attack it. And people have so many preconceived notions about it. But, you know, I kind of believe that kids gravitate toward the medium that works for them. So, you know, I I think, you know, given an equal choice of all, a lot of kids would go to technology. Don't get me wrong. Um, But I think that some kids just love being outside and they're tactile and they they love that. I think some kids, you know, maybe the library and books really, uh, they gravitate to that for their learning. But for when I look at technology and computers specifically in the Internet, I mean, it's a it's the best book possible. Right. Because you can be looking at something or on a video with some YouTuber and they start talking about World War Two and how Hitler came to power. And you can pop out and go do a search and look at a wiki that tells you that information so you can verify what's being said. You then mm-hmm. can like, oh, and what about, you know, the rice shog fire or whatever? You know, you can like dive in even further into these other things. Like, I, you know, to me, and this is how my kids do it, um, because I'm just mm-hmm. flabbergasted most days when I hear them talk about things that I never learned in school. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, like to me, like that, it's it's an endless portal into knowledge, right? And the best Mm -hmm. part about it is we know, because we've watched kids do this, kids don't learn everything about everything all at once. So they kind of pick little pieces that satisfy the need that's presented them right now. And then they step back and usually think about that. And then they go and they'll do something else. And then they'll find another piece that may not even look related, but it's kind of informing the other. And the Internet's really well suited to that. Right. Um, It's not, you know, when they come and ask me questions and I look up a wiki, I'll start talking and I'll give them their answer. And then I'll do two more sentences. And they're like, they've walked away already because, (laughs) you know, they're like, yeah, I already got the answer. I don't care about the rest of that. And it's helped me a ton in recognizing for us, strewing is not something that really happens here. Um, You know, for for us, my kids self-strew, if that makes sense. They're so curious and so interested in so many things that they tend to deep dive in their own areas. And when Mm -hmm. I get too excited about something, I can put the damper on their interest pretty quickly. (laughs) So I have to be really (laughs) careful. Uh, But I think that's just because they've really been given a ton of freedom about it. Um, And Mm -hmm. so they know their own mind. And oftentimes my assessment of what they want to know is not correct. They want something else. And so they just need to go get that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that was that's something that I found as well was that what was most important was for me to um, stay open and available yeah. Rather than trying to um, anticipate too much. Right. You know, sure, I if I found things, I would share them. But yeah, without the any expectation that they would want to go in that direction. And I'd be careful, again, minimizing not sharing um, any kind of agenda at all behind it. Because I didn't want to knock them off the path that they were following. I just wanted to just say, oh, I came across this. Uh, you know, and maybe it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a turn, a little bit of an angle and, and, uh, just so that they knew 
that it existed, but it didn't matter at all if they were going to take that turn because mostly it was about being open to help them. Like if they wanted to make this jump, this connection, and they needed a little bit of something from me, I wanted to be able to um, satisfy that as quickly as possible so they could keep going because it was just amazing watching them make all these connections and fly through it, right? Right. And I think, you know, here, each kid does it differently. But I, one of my sons, around dinner time, comes and brain dumps on you. Like he just yeah. gives you, yeah. he just starts talking. And, you know, so mm-hmm. he just starts going and he'll, he kind of, you know, sometimes it's a cohesive step to step to step. Sometimes it's just information coming at you. And what yeah. he's really doing is testing his theories, right? So he's Mm -hmm. saying, this is this way. And if you say, if you nod and say, yeah, that sounds right, he's great, moves on. And then if it sounds like it's something that might need a little bit more, you know, or, hey, did you look at this way? Like I might say, hey, you know, you also could look at it in this way. He's just culling his mind map, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's saying, okay, and he's, he's moving in things from one bucket to another. And he's just like, okay. And then it's not a huge conversation. Um, A lot of it's, him coming at me in more of a monologue, but Mm -hmm. he's really testing his hypotheses. Right. And it's, and it's from the whole day of what he's been doing and his daily process is amazing. I mean, he has two hours of YouTube videos in the morning about, and then he'll eat breakfast. Um, and then he starts playing Roblox, which is one of his main areas of playing. And he has numerous games there. And then he's on steam to do subnautica or some other game, Um, and then sometimes, you know, in the afternoons, he's like, Hey mom, you want to go and play blah, blah, blah. We'll play a game together. Um, sometimes we do board games. Um, so, you know, you watch and these, their day is very, um, uniform. Um, but if I were to just say, Hey, it's screens, I would miss all of that, but they have an amazing (laughs) daily process. Right. Um, and I'm like impressed by it because they really don't veer from it. And it helps me when we schedule things or when we have things outside of the house, I have to be very respectful of their daily process. Um, Mm -hmm. doctor's appointments don't happen here until the afternoon or late morning, because if my son doesn't get his two hours to kind of catch up on all the new YouTube videos out there, Mm -hmm. he's very unhappy and does not want to leave the house. So we have to be really respectful of the fact that, Hey, you know what? I would want someone to grant me that same respect. So. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I know. And, and it's all about how, like you said, how the different personalities, different children process things, right? I have Joseph's very much um, a verbal kind of processor and we would have those conversations just about daily, you know, um, him dumping out and, and, you know, we're connected enough and, you know, in our, our relationship that if I think it's a conversation where he's looking for my input, yeah. you know, and I start saying something and he's not, he can say, no, mom, right. I'm just like saying, yeah. I, exactly. I don't want to hear right now. And I'm like, yeah, right. no problem. You know, and I can just absorb, absorb. And, and other times we're um, bouncing things back and forth and we can end up for like an hour and a half conversation that I'm sure nobody listening would understand. <laughs> Right. Because we just jumped from here. We know where the connections went for each of us, but nobody else would ever be able to tell how we got from A to B to C. Right. Right. And and we've also learned that it's very important for each of us to finish our thoughts because we can't move on until we've finished. Although, Mm -hmm. I mean, we're we're quick, but we still need to close it before we make the next shot. So we're like putting our hands up. You know, so that they know that I have something to add when you're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, then there's another child who who very much does a lot of that, who's like um, me for my personal stuff, who does a lot of that processing internally. And once we've kind of figured it out, then we're ready to move on and chat with other people. And so when he comes asking for something, he's not he doesn't need a conversation about it. He just wants to do it because he's already had all that conversation in his head, figured it out, and now he's ready to move on. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of stuff that you learn by getting um, deeply engaged with your kids and seeing what they're doing. It's just seeing how they process information, seeing what's interesting to them. I guess we should move on to the next question, but it's all very fascinating. (laughs) 
And I think we might have uh, hit this, but let's just make sure. If a parent is concerned about the amount of time a child is spending, say watching TV or playing video games, instead of immediately imposing limits to fit the parent's comfort zone, how might they explore the situation to discover what's up? Yeah. So I think we have talked about a bunch of this, but, you know, so I would say it's de-schooling and it's really about playing with them or sitting next to them and watching, um, you know, write down the learning if it makes you feel better. Um, And I think also sometimes sharing that with your partner or spouse, as we kind of talked about before, so that because Mm -hmm. a lot of times it's not the parent who's home with the kids who has as many of the questions about the, the use of technology in general. Um, It may be the parent who's coming home and saying, geez, is this all you did all day? Um, Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, being in, and, you know, my husband's really thankful when I share that stuff with him because he's like, yeah, I wouldn't have known. And he's, he's appreciative because he doesn't want to sit in judgment when it's unfair. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, you know, I, one thing that I have learned and it's because I've been open is that games are steeped in science, history, mythology, fantasy, math, problem solving, critical thought, strategy, research, like everything about what we want our kids to be capable of, they mm-hmm. get through games. Um, and, and the main reason being is that gaming companies hire people who are really well versed, PhDs in education, right? And how mm-hmm. the you know learning processes, right? So um they know exactly how to hand information so that it's easily absorbable. And they talk a lot about um the regime of competence, right? You know, like you have yep. Yep. you're capable for, you know, of certain things when you're a noob, right? And then, you know, yep. you get when you move on to the next level, in general, when you first go into that level, you realize that you're missing some key piece of knowledge. So you can still fight there, you know, if you're fighting a battle of some sort, you can still fight in the same way, but it's not netting you the same results as quickly. So you realize you have to learn something or you have to get better gear or you have to do something. Um, and sometimes that information is obvious or sometimes you actually find helpful people along the way who tell you that, right? You know, these are all yep. life lessons, right? <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. uh, and you, you know, you then can realize, ah, so I need to do this. So the, the information is handed to you in an incremental fashion that makes it extremely easy to assimilate, right? And to move yeah. on. Um, and, you know, this is unlike school completely, right? This is where school has it wrong. <laughs> you know, I yeah. completely <laughs> have it wrong. And if school was set up like a video game, it would be amazing to see how engaged kids were, right? Um, because it would be all about that, you know, keeping kids within the regime of confidence and every kid's regime of confidence is going to be slightly different, right? Um, mm-hmm. And then making sure that they're getting incremental um, ads so that they can kind of level up, so to speak, right? Um, and I think that, you know, that is really important for people to understand that the reason, and we'll talk about this on the addiction side, but, um, you know, when people say it's addiction, um, you know, I think it's the reality is, is that this is how all humans learn. And the reason that we all like these gaming in general and why we play on our iPhones all the time is because it feeds us in a way that is just inherent in the human condition. Um, and, uh, and it's, it feels good to do well at things and to constantly have feedback. Right. Um, I I could jump in there because if I can just, yeah, yeah, because when I, I remember it reminded me when you were talking about that, um, the definition of, uh, flow in Mm -hmm. finding flow, Mihai, Csikszentmihalyi, he talks about that, that feeling of flow. Um, and you know, when time passes and you don't realize it when you're so into it is when you're sitting at, right at the edge of your level of competence, right? Yeah. You have, you have just enough skill that you know you're close and yet you're, so you're super keen to learn all those last little bits. Yeah. You know, it's hard to get in the flow of something that's entirely repetitive because you already know how to do it. You're all fully skilled at it. You know, right. that's boring. And if it's too, too hard, you know, it's too challenging. You can't figure it out. And, you know, it's hard to completely hard to stay engaged in that as well. Right. But when you're 
right at that level where you know you know just you know enough to keep going and keep going um but there's still lots to learn and figure out that's where all the exciting learning is and that's where you sink into the flow of the activity so yeah, yeah. that's that's just really exciting and yes that is something that um Games are really good at, and they've spent so much time um, figuring out through levels. Joseph and I would talk about this all the time, you know, how how you can gather that one piece of information that you need to move on and how as you get, as you level up and as you move from world to world, as you progress in the story, all the different pieces that come together, how they flow that whole story together. Right. It's, it's really interesting. And then, yeah, I mean, finding... Um, games or, or any kind of activity that's within um a person's interest right, right? Uh, it, the that environment for that interest is a great way um to learn and play and like you said there are just so many aspects to manage that the skills um that they pick up in doing this are transferable skills right oh, yeah. i mean the ability to take in multiple things, um, analyze it and choose a path forward just because it's virtual. Those still skills are still transferable into the real world, into a situation where you have three things coming at you and you want to decide what your best next step is. It's totally right. useful. <laughs> right. And I think, okay. you know, there's, there's tons of side mm -hmm. effect learning. You know, side effect learning is where it's all at. And, you know, like I, so I always thought on schooling was like, Hey, you know, kids will be exposed to all this learning and they will pick up, you know, at the early, in the, my early stages, they'll pick up all their schooling, school learning, because it's just fun when they pick it up. And what I've realized is that the, all of the schoolish learning that they get is side effect learning from gaming. So yeah. <laughs> all the math they've gotten and all the reading and writing and history and science has come just because games are steeped with all this stuff, right? So mm -hmm. it's not like they have had somebody say, what's two plus two? They conceptually get it because they've played all these games. You know, Minecraft, perfect example. If you have three players playing and you want to do iron armor for everyone, it's 72 pieces of iron. Right. Mm -hmm. And my kids knew that before you could you could never ask them, well, what's 24 times three? They wouldn't yeah. be able to tell you, but they know how much iron they need to make <laughs> three sets of armor. You know, in and, and if you can take away that need to control it in the, you know, the the schoolish way, they get to the point where they do understand multiplication. Right. And factoring mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But um, initially, they just know that they need X number of whatever it is to do something, you know, could just be X number of gold to go buy that next sword that gives them better, you know, hit rates or something. Yeah. But, um, you, know, I, you know, I laugh because, you know, I have a son who loves first person shooter games on Xbox. This yeah. is the son who likes the challenges and the competition. And he's a CEO in Grand Theft Auto. Right. He has his own. Mm -hmm crew he pulls people in he has to deal with giving them cuts of the the loot that they get he has to then pay for all of the upfront costs of the guns and the whatever <laughs> and you know he's running a business um and when he's really into that you know he recognizes that sometimes in order to get the good you know his friends who are better at the heists to come he has to give them a larger cut of the the pie or mm -hmm. he's got a friend who really needs some cash, so he's willing to give him a bigger cut, you know, those types of things. But that's all yeah. negotiation, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, that is a huge life skill in just recognizing that, hey, people have to be somewhat motivated to want to help you out. And you have to take on costs to do these types of jobs, you know. It's just an interesting, you know, whereas most people would say, oh, GTA, I'd never let my kid play that. Well, yep. My goodness, like, I'm so glad I let my kid play that. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it, there's huge learning there. Yeah, that's, a, it's, it's so fun. Once you've got that relationship where they'll come and, and talk, chat with you about what they're playing and what they're doing and what they're figuring out, mm. you just sit there and listen and go, wow, 
yeah. you know, <laughs> Every and day. to know enough to be able, yeah, exactly. <laughs> to, to know, you have to know enough to be able to understand what they're sharing so that you can see what it really means. Right. But yeah, it, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We better move on. Uh, something <laughs> that can under parents is when their child gets angry when asked to stop playing a video game or watching TV. Um, fear can quickly have them interpreting that behavior as addicted and blaming the technology, as we were alluding to earlier. Um, when we look at the situation from the child's perspective, things can look really different, though, can't they? Like you were talking about with your son, who you know wants his. Uh, his YouTube videos in the mornings to, you know, get caught up and, and see what's happening. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, if I, so I'm really, I think it was because I was in sales for my career, but I'm really good at putting myself in other people's shoes. And I've always mm -hmm. kind of done that. So, and I know when I'm in the flow and I'm doing something, you know, doing research or a task that I particularly enjoy, um, I bristle at interruptions, you know, sometimes yeah. I'm, you know, nice about it. Sometimes I'm not so nice about it, but it, it, you know, it doesn't take much to realize that kids are having the same thing. Right. And I yeah. think that it's even worse if the limits arbitrarily assigned, right. Oh, you've had your hour. Right. So, oh, yeah. you know, because that just seems number one, you know, I, I never try, I never impose a rule on my children that I wouldn't want imposed on myself. Um, and that's been a good guide marker for me. Um, so, um, but I also think that, um, you know, we've always had the rule here that when we're transitioning into something else, like we do have to go to a dentist appointment or go do something, you know, my kids are always allowed to finish what they're doing before we move. So i it requires me to be a little bit more, you know, ahead of the game, like give them a half an hour, 45 minutes notice that, you know, we have something coming up. But they always have, we always have given, that, given them the respect to say, hey, finish what you're doing. So they can finish the game, they can finish the project, they can finish the call, whatever it might be. Um, and we're pretty flexible with that. Um, so we tend not to see a lot of anger um, coming off when we do have to come off. Um, but we also, our kids really manage their own time mm -hmm. on computers. Um, so, you know, at least I understand where that comes from. Um, but again, I think this comes back to de-schooling, right? Um, yeah. You know, really yeah. thinking about, you know, instead of just assuming, you know, like I think the only people who might say, hey, my kid's addicted to this are people who already have issues with the use of technology in their house. So, yeah. um, you know, and, and I think that again, we chatted about it before, but if I have an, an, an agenda or if I have a, an energy about the use of technology, my kids feel it. And I don't have to say a word, but they get it, right? Um, so I think we have to own our own energy. Um, but, you know, the values in our society are about balance and moderation. And technology generally, when you see it used by kids, is not that, right? They tend to deep dive and are very happy and joyful. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, I think that for those of us who are brought up with balance and moderation as kind of a family value, um, we get uncomfortable with excess, you know, excess in anything, excess in food, excess in um, joy, you know, when kids are too happy, you know, I think people get uncomfortable <laughs> sometimes, right? Um, you know, and I, I think that you know, kids are just trying to figure out, they always want to come to the stasis of joy, right? Or happiness. Yeah. And they'll, they'll get there. Sometimes even, you know, they'll force themselves there because they always seem to want to get to that equilibrium. And if we just let them get there, they chill out, they relax a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's um, a cool way to look at it. Yeah, that's true. And and when you think about it too, because technology, uh, there was a couple of things, because technology is um, so new to us even, right? Mm -hmm. As adults, we didn't grow up with it. We can even take those messages around us of, of balance and, and fear of too much technology and, and slam ourselves with it too, right? So right. part of 
part of this, at least part of it for me was first um, coming to terms with it in my, my own use and realizing, you know, no, I'm choosing this because, and I'm getting A, B, C, D out of it. <laughs> and then this is what I'm doing. And the other piece is um, it, when we talked about, you know, screen time in general, how that is composed of so many different things is also realizing that, okay, yeah, you could say screen time and, and you could say hours, but you know, I was communicating on my phone. So I was texting with my kids, you know, cause my kids are older right. and maybe I was watching a DVD for some research and, you know, looking up recipes on the computer. Like we're using it now for so many different things that that's one of the challenges of putting it all under this misnomer of screen time, because then all of a sudden it looks powerful, right? Rather okay. than taking a moment to actually dive in and recognize all the multiple ways that you we're using different technologies. Well, right. And I think, you know, I, I have, and I don't see maybe this much in the unschooling space, but in the conventional world where parents are sitting on their computer and yet telling their kids they can only use an hour. You yeah. Know? <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and I'm always like, you know, and I, I think that's disingenuous, right? You know, that we shouldn't have double standards, you know, that if, if I truly have an issue with my children using technology, then I should really be owning how much I'm using it. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I also think that greatness comes from passion, right? And I've met, you know, through my husband and because I think he works in his passion and I, he has many friends who also are somewhat passionate about what they do. And they all um, tend to excel at the things that they're passionate about. And mm -hmm. I think greatness comes from passion. And passion in general, when you meet someone who has had great success or is, is very passionate, they rarely have balance, Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't see many, you know, you don't see like Michael Jordan, you know, basketball player. He, I doubt he had a lot of balance in his life. Right. Yeah. And or a lot of moderation. And from what, you know, Carol Dweck says in her book, he practiced basketball all the time. Right. And I see mm -hmm. that, you know, with Ed, Ed, he codes a lot, you know, he's on the computer a lot. It's just what he does, but he's really good at what he does. Right. And I think when I've met people, musicians who are really good at what they do, they play their instrument a lot. Um, so if, if my children are going to be really good at technology or really good at researching and, and learning from technology, then they're probably going to spend a bunch of time on it. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it's important to respect it. Um, and, and yeah. because in disrespecting it, I, you then end up sending the message that you disrespect the child. And I think that's not worthwhile in any family, um, but certainly not in unschooling families. Yeah. And, and over the years, I've never found balance to be something that was really useful as a goal because balance seemed to be a framework I was trying to put on top of myself or my kids, right? Right. Whereas it, stamps, it tamps down joy, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If we did instead follow our joy, oh my gosh, everything was always so much better. We were so much more engaged. Um, we were just having so much more fun and, and trying to put balance on top of that just really screwed it all up. Right. So yeah. it, it's, and that's why I ended up, you know, calling my website Living Joyfully, not not Living Balanced Lives. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because it was just such a better a uh, better goal. <laughs> right. Right. Yep. Yeah. Well, and I think that that's hard for a lot of people, right? I mean, you yeah. know, we get messages all day long growing up. You know, this is, you know, the the question is, is when do you break that chain, right? That, you know, mm -hmm. like Living to joy is something that very few people have the opportunity to do. However, in our family, in the last four years of our unschooling life, we as a family have made that choice and everything has gotten better. Everything. Yeah. My relationship with my husband has gotten better. My health has gotten better. I now exercise because I want to be my best self physically, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, my kids, you know, I, I love hearing them laugh. Like, you know, I, when I hear conventional parents talk about their kids and all of the stuff they have to do, honestly, it makes me very sad because number one, I'm like, where's the joy? Right. There's no joy. Yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't want to come home to that house. Right. 
Um, you know, whereas most people, most kids, when they walk in our house, don't want to leave. Um, mm -hmm. because you know, you're number one, you're respected for who you are. You have agency over what you want to do. And number three, in general, it's fun, right? There's a trampoline in the family room. There is a swing in the basement. There's rings. There's, you know, computers all over the place. There's music, you know, whatever you want to do, um, is pretty much available at any time. So, yeah. And, and you see by taking that time, you know, th especially through your de-schooling time to dive in and really, um, watch what's going on and watch your kids, you realize that, oh, you know, if my goal was control and school and, and, you know, for them to learn, if my ultimate goal was for them to learn, um, look at, they're doing so much more learning, so much more fascinating learning, um, and they're happier and, and the whole place is, is happier. Our lives are happier and I'm ultimately getting, you know, what I originally thought my goal was in the first place. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. And it's not yeah. hard. Nothing is hard. Like, exactly. you know, there's no friction. I mean, yeah, there's some days you wake up and you're just like, ugh, you know, but honestly, like there just isn't friction and I don't create friction on purpose. <laughs> You know, yeah. like I, there's very few swords on which to on which I will fall. Right. I yeah. just it just is runs counter to joy and it's not worth it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and as I said, like, you know, just from a relationship standpoint between my husband and I, I mean, we might, you know, whatever, you know, say something to each other and, you know, whatever in a naggy way. And then like in three minutes, we're laughing at each other because we're like, yeah, that was kind of funny. Like you just, <laughs> yeah. you get to a point where it's just, it's outside of your normal being. And, you yeah. know, for folks who believe in the power of universal energy, when you live joyfully, pretty much anything you want in your life, you can manifest in, right? So mm -hmm. if you, understand law of attraction and how to get things and how to, you know, get your life into a, a situation where things, good things happen a lot. Joy is the first step of that, right? Is really living where you believe everything is possible. Um, and, uh, and I love that my kids are seeing this, right? Um, you know, how powerful will that be as they grow up? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, exactly. That's awesome. Um, next question. One of the big aha moments for me when I was examining my attitude toward technology was the realization that my children learn so much more about weaving technology into their lives through actual experience. Um, you know, like we were talking about, instead of the, the framework, trying to impose it by letting them, um, experience it and, and follow it to their own, uh, needs. Uh, they learn so much more that way. Um, and, and it's the same way they've learned so many other things through unschooling, right? Through mm -hmm. all the other more academic stuff that, you know, originally was quite easy to understand. Of course, they'd be more, they'd learn more as if they were interested in what they were um, engaged in. So mm -hmm. what are some of the things that you've seen your children learn about life with digital, digital tech? Yeah. So we have many, um, you know, I think for us, you know, and I, I speak on de schooling. So, you know, I kind of come up with these social messages that we often hear, societal messages that we often hear. And one of the ones that commonly comes up, and you see it a lot, is grit and metal. Um, yeah. You know, like how will a kid develop grit and metal and stick to itiveness if they aren't forced to kind of stay in something? And yeah. I have to say, I love that what gaming has brought to our family is the recognition that kids stick into things that are important and they walk away from things that aren't. Um, and oftentimes the things they walk away from is not a permanent walk away. It's just walking away for a period of time until they're better prepared to step back in. Um, mm -hmm. So what I've seen is my kids will you know, start a game and be like, ah, it's, I'm just not, you know, capable of doing what I want to do in it. So I'm going to set it aside for a while. And then three or four months later, they'll come back and they'll have finished like the storyline of the whole thing within 24 hours. So that's kind of the stepping back in. But what I've also seen is that they have amazing grit to stick in. And like prime example at the holidays, around the holidays, my son had gotten Pokemon um, Ruby, I think. Mm -hmm. And it was on the DS 
and he wanted to finish the game and there's a Pokemon, a legendary that you can get at the end that you have to, you beat it. And then I think you get it as part of your, you know, benefit. Yeah. And he played the game no less than five times all the way through because he recognized as he got to the final battle that he needed to have certain capabilities in his Pokemon that mm -hmm. were not going to allow him to win. And so he would play through or get that legendary and so he yep. played through and it take it took about 27 hours I think for him to play through from beginning to end and he did it five times. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean I know I, I'm like in awe because I would have been like oh my gosh I would never do that, right? And he yeah. stuck in it and it wasn't even and I have to say so if anybody knows about Pokémon on the DS the big the big feedback that they've gotten is that their cutscenes are too long and you can't skip them. <laughs> so mm. no. you know the dialogue part <laughs> So, yeah, you know, yeah. like he was complaining the whole time he was in like the fourth and fifth round of like these cutscenes are brutal, you know, like it was just, but he had <laughs> to stick in it because he was trying to get through and he did finally get through and he, and he got the legendary he was shooting for. But that's, wow. you know, you think about the amount of hours that he had to sit there and play that. To me, that's grit, right? That's, that is mm -hmm. recognizing that it was important enough. I think the challenge with the conventional world and grit and metal is that we, we want kids to do stuff that's no fun. And then we wonder why they want to quit and we don't want to let them. Well, it's because they aren't bought in. Right. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, I, if you give a kid something in you know, an interest that they really want to focus on and they will focus on it until they'll hold on to it very tightly. Um, and so I, that was a real aha moment for me and all of this because you know, you don't always know whether, you know, when you're starting out in this life, you know, geez, you know, am I doing the right thing? You kind of always take litmus tests here and there just to check in. You know, are these kids going to be well suited to live in the conventional world someday? And yeah. that one was a real big aha for me. Um, you know, the quitting and reengaging was really important. You know, we've always allowed our kids to quit, even if there's money on the line, because um, I want that. You know, I always say that I never impose something on my kids that I wouldn't allow myself to do um, or that I allow myself to do. So I want to be able to quit something if it wasn't quite what I was anticipating or hoping for. So I would mm -hmm. let my kids do that, too. Um, but, you know, some other side effect learning that we've had is you know just navigating social interactions. So we do a lot of Skyping um, with our gaming. Um, all of my kids closest friends except for one of my daughter's friends are all Skype and gaming friends. Um, yeah. And these are solid, strong relationships. We've gotten to know some of these kids IRL in real life. Um, yeah. So, um, and we've actually, we have, you know, one of our close friends, Skype friends comes and visits periodically from Connecticut. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, they've, I've listened to them when they're dealing with the social interactions and they're just the same as if these kids were playing on the playground, Right. They have yep. a kid who's being a little bit nudgy and, you know, no one likes it and they put up with it for a little while. And then they figure out ways that they can tell that kid, hey, if you keep acting nudgy, we aren't going to play with you anymore. You know, mm -hmm. this is perfect social learning that's happening. Um, you know, they I, I see that they kind of self-select amongst, you know, who are the kids that are more like me to play with. Um and they manage conflict really well. Like, I am just impressed, you know, even to the point where one of my sons was online with this kid playing GTA. And the kid was like, hey, I want to there's this player online. I want to go give her a hard time and harass her and blah, blah, blah. And my son just said to him, he goes, well, why do you want to do that? And he was just like, oh, because it'll be fun. You know, let's make fun of her and just, you know, mess with her. And Cole said, well, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. So I'll just, you know, call me back when you're ready to play again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't even stress him out. Like he didn't think he was just like, yeah, that doesn't sound like fun. You know, going to bully a girl just because she's online. Like I have no interest in doing that. So yeah. and he was just like, yeah, it doesn't sound like fun to me. Didn't make him upset in any way. And he was just like, yeah, I'm not doing that. So in my mind, you know, that I can't ask for better, right, in terms of social learning for my kids, you know, to be able to know themselves so well that they recognize when something doesn't fit with kind of their own, um, you know, moral, temp you know, temperature, I guess. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, I found, and then, I found that, too. Oh, you sorry. did? Uh, yeah, with 
it was so interesting to me because, you know, Lissy would be um, out with, you know, with her friends, uh, local friends, um, with girl guides and pathfinders, all, all those kinds of situations. And, and she would talk to me about the issues and, and, you know, we'd go through some of the situations and then Joseph would be gaming online and at other times I'd be talking to him and it's the same thing, right? And they're, they're all learning the same kind of, um, learning to navigate the same kind of situations. One was online and one right. was face to face, but it was still, still the same things. You know, it wasn't that social outcast in the basement gaming, right. you know, it was all the same, Right. <laughs> just a different environment. Right. Well, and I think we've also learned about the dark side of the internet. I think, you know, mm -hmm. people are fearful of some of the bad things that can happen. You know, I will say straight up, we really have had no problems with um, predators in any way. So I, mm -hmm. I think that's important to say. I mean, my kids have been online nonstop for four years and there's none of that. There certainly is some inappropriate behavior where in some mm -hmm. of the role playing games, you know, there are kids who are like, hey, you want a date, you know, and saying things yeah. that they probably shouldn't and stuff. Um, they certainly have run, run across scammers and, you know, nothing better about learning a lesson than to have something happen to you when the stakes are very low, right? Yeah. So you lose some Robux or Robux or something, you know, it's not, it's not the end of the world. That's something that can be easily rectified. Um, but it's a really, um, good lesson to learn early and the younger, the better, um, you know, hacking, they, you know, my kids have never been hacked, but they've had friends who've been hacked where, mm -hmm. you know, they always have these, um, you know, like, Hey, send us your, you know, login and we'll send you a thousand, you know, in-game dollars or something. Yeah, and yeah, that's yeah. just a way to get your account. Right. So my kids know, like they're smarter than I am on some of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they've actually, you know, they've, They've delved into, you know, like the kids online are really good about, you know, they call things racist and sexist. And uh, and sometimes it's a little too often, you know, like, oh, I don't know if, you know, saying that, you know, if you say the word leprechaun at St. Patty's Day, I'm not sure that's considered racist. You know, like, yeah. you know, they're hyper aware of some of these things. And so we get to chat about, OK, well, what what is racist and, you know, where does that, you know, where are the lines drawn? Because some of this is gray area, right? Um, so many conversations, right? Yes, I mean, all definitely. of that. And I think that's a, another piece I don't think quite come up, but these are the tools of our culture now, right? Yes. And for them to be very familiar with and to understand the ins and outs um, while we're there to help them figure it all out is, is amazing rather than, you know, being controlled and out of fear, you know, not being able to engage enough to discover all these piece aspects, aspects of the environment. And then, you know, being caught by surprise when they're older and on their own. And oh, yeah. like you said, when these things probably have a much greater impact in their lives and in their days. Right. right. So I think that's so important. No. And I, you know, I think about it because, you know, like kids, I, it's very likely at some point my kids will be like, Hey, I want to put my computer in my room, <laughs> you know, and we don't have yeah. that right now. Um, although I, I, they may not, you know, who knows, but you know, like I love the fact that I really know their whole online persona and how they interact online because I don't have any fears about them online. Like they're cautious and aware. Um, and I'm always impressed by the choices and the decisions they make when hard things come up. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's, you know, part of, being a parent who's around, you know, and, and you, you can't help but trust your kids because you spent so many years of watching them make decisions. You know, sometimes they're good decisions. Sometimes they're decisions that may not have gone their way, but you see how they come to those decisions. And so you can't mm -hmm. help but trust them because they, you've witnessed the good head on their shoulders. Right. Yeah. Um, and you've been there to kind of guide here and there when things are less sure um, but you know, like the last aha moment I'd written down here is just that my kids can make mistakes and retry. And, you know, there's, that's in our culture, that's not common, right? You know, my kids make mistakes all day long. You know, they bought, they spent 60 bucks on a game that they don't particularly like. 
Well, that's an expensive mistake, right? For someone who doesn't, whose allowance doesn't really allow them to accrue that money pretty quick. Um, so you yeah, know, they made those such mistakes, a huge one. or yeah, they had a that, scammer. Yep. Yeah, because yeah, because it's all um, it's all learning, and because they don't. They haven't been shamed so much. At, you know, mistakes aren't big red X's. Right. Right. That you're scared to make. Um, they're like, oh, geez, that didn't go the way I expected or whatever. And, you know, off, sometimes there's there's real disappointment mixed up in there, too. But it's a, you can see them incorporating all that the next time they make a decision, right? right? The next time they make a choice. So you can just see them learning, picking, adapting and making another decision and making another decision. And that trust just grows so much just just from seeing them in action. Right. Well, right. And gaming is the land of mistakes and retries, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in every single game, you, you know, you, whether you're in a battle, you die, you regen. <laughs> yep, <laughs> exactly, again. right? Like, it's inherent yeah. in the system. Mistakes are part of how you progress. Um, mm -hmm. So my kids do not fear mistakes at all. Like, and, and we yeah. kind of always said, you know, how do you get good at something? And it's through practice, you know? Like, you're never good at something right out the gate. I mean, it just doesn't yeah. happen. So, yeah. And, and they, they, that's one of the many things they learn, right? That whole gaming environment is, is built on that. It's built on uh, figuring things out, making a mistake. Oh, I learned that bit. I learned that bit. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. Iterative. Everything uh, is iterative, right? I mean, iterative, it, that's a if great we word. Think yeah. Of our, the way that we have lived as adults, everything in our adulthood is iterative. We learn to be mm -hmm. parents in an iterative fashion. <laughs> Right. Yep. Exactly. I mean, we didn't come out knowing how to parent teens. I mean, you know, you didn't know how to parent yep. adults, right? You, exactly. It's an iterative process. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. <laughs> um, okay. The next question we actually chatted about earlier. So um, we'll go on to the last one. Uh, as always with unschooling, it's important to be engaged with our children, whatever their interest or passion. And one of the concerns I hear regularly um, is that parents feel disconnected from their children because they are engaged in their interest through technology. You know, he's always watching TV or, you know, he's always gaming. So I wanted to talk about some of the ways that we can engage with our children, even when they're using digital tools. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we alluded to this in the last Part, but I think the younger you start with your kids on these these you know computer or on video games, and you're with them, it's almost better because you really it, it's an evolution, right? Mm -hmm. You understand how they play really well, um, and so as they get older, and some of the harder questions come up, or the harder social stuff might come up, or yeah. the stakes seem to be higher in some way. Um, you know, they have a lot of foundation, foundational knowledge that really just sets them up to kind of be, you know, pretty well um, capable of, of making decisions or sitting inside of that. Um, mm -hmm. And I so I always had my office was always next to where my kids computers are. So um, that's been for four years. And so I might be doing my own thing and they might be doing their own thing, but I always have my ear to what's happening. And early on, they didn't have headphones. So I kind of just heard everybody's conversations yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I could kind of get a feel for, you know, how they were handling stress. I knew I could hear if something was getting stressful and I could just walk over and say, hey, you know, do you want some food or, hey, is there anything I can do to help? <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. um, because exactly. sometimes a kid could be mean. Can I look and... up that walkthrough? <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, right. Exactly. Can I look up a cheat for you? Right. Because they're yeah. getting frustrated. Right. You know, hey, you want me to help? Um, and so I always just kind of knew that. And so now there's, you know, and I never had judgment about what they were doing. So they have no problem telling me anything that's going on. I mean, to the point now where we play cards against humanity together. Right. And, you know, my kids are still mm -hmm. relatively young. <laughs> But, you know, like nothing is off the table in terms of what comes up. And, you know, we've had quite a few laughs playing that game because of funny things that have come up. But, yeah. um, you know, like it, 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 I think my kids just don't feel that there's any taboo subject here. Um, and I'm 
pretty excited about that because I didn't grow up with that. You know, I mean, I yeah. wouldn't say there were taboo subjects, but as a kid, I would never have discussed many things with my parents. You know, it just mm-hmm. wouldn't have come up. And so I can do that. Um, but, you know, when things do get stressful, it's like you bring food or you try and figure out a way to help. Right. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if if certain friendships, you know, are changing or shifting, you know, I try to yeah, use unschooling gamers to try and find new um, folks to maybe connect with, um, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 at this point, you know, my son Cole meets most of his friends via Internet Xbox online so it's not even like people that we happen to know who unschool anymore yeah these are just straight kids out in the world right <laughs> you know yeah, yeah and um and i'm really impressed with his willingness to you know cut bait on the ones that aren't good gaming partners and to you know embrace the ones who are and um you know and i listen in on those conversations just so i can make sure that it's not anything weird going on right and he's yeah. he's got a great sense about people um just because he's done it for a long time and he'll pull himself out of something that doesn't feel right so i'm pretty psyched about that um but i think yeah, other no. parents just knowing the lingo know who the cool youtubers are laugh when you hear them you know saying their funny stuff um watch with them i don't know yeah it really is like like we were saying before it's it's about digging in and and actually engaging with them. Right. Right. I mean, it's getting past that, uh, that whole technology screen. I'm going to leave them to, you know, even from the, with the greatest intention, you say, okay, I understand. It's really important. I'm going to leave them to it. That's not, that's going to lead you to those disconnected feelings because, um, like you said, they, they know our energy. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're accepting enough to let them do it, but we're not excited about it and engaged with them. So they're not going to come and share X, Y, and Z also out of consideration for you. Cause they figure you're not interested right. in X, Y, and Z details about it. Right. Right. So it really is about showing that interest and that openness, openness and that willingness to engage with them on the topics that they're interested in, whether it's the TV shows themselves, what it is that makes them laugh, the, the YouTubers that they like to follow. You know, if you know a YouTuber, like Michael sent me a YouTube link, a couple of months ago and said, I think you might like this. So, you know, I actually watched a couple of them so that next time I saw him, I could say, Hey, yeah, I watched that. I love this. We had a conversation, Mm -hmm. you know, and then that, that led me to seeing what it was that he enjoyed about it. Right. Right. Just more information that we both share and I shared what I liked. And now we knew each other a little bit better in the, in that aspect. Right. Isn't that just being a good, you know, like that's just good social work right it's what we have yeah. to do with our it's it's what we have to do with our spouses you know you it's that know shift things. it's yeah. just you know you have to show interest you know i la- i chuckle because I, you know my husband is a software engineer right he works on compilers right i mean mm-hmm. I, I compilers are really esoteric like you can't get your head around what a compiler really does um mm-hmm. it sits way low in the stack and, yep. you know, Evan will often talk to me about what he's doing. And I really try to understand, right? And I do from a top level, you know, a macro level, understand mm-hmm. what he's talking about. But it's important, something that's really important to him. It's really important to me to make sure that I understand enough to be able to have a conversation with him and not just stand there with my eyes, you know, rolling back in my head. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I do that for him, you know, and and uh, and as he's gotten more and more deep on his technology, it's harder and harder for me to jam with him on that stuff. But I mm-hmm. view that my kids, that's the same job. Right. And it's about connecting, because when you have a connection with someone, you know, when you have that deep connection with people like, you know, that's the essence of you know, human existence. Right. And and you don't Mm -hmm. get it with everyone you walk across. You know, you might say you have hundreds of friends, but there's only going to be a handful that you can really connect with in that way. And I love Mm -hmm. that I have four people in this house that I have those relationships with because, um, 
it it's there's a flow in just the relationship that's quite fun to experience, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think as I know, like we say it all the time, but that this is the essence is that shift away from that parent child relationship, right? From um, even if you don't think there's power involved, if you still if you're still up there looking down, um, that, that adds a layer that gets in the way in your relationship. It's about being with them just as people, just respecting them as a human being, as a person and wanting to know what they're interested in. Right. And, right. and you know, even you just that. reminded me, even if you have a lens of what is the educational value or what are they learning? <laughs> that mm -hmm. is, yeah. a la that's a layer that goes in front of that relationship. Right. Yep. And, I, you yep. know, and it doesn't need to be there because your kids will reveal to you all that they're learning when they are in the flow of the relationship. Right. Because they're yep. excited and they're happy and exactly. you will be you'll be introduced to all of their wonder just by yep. being open. Right. Yep. I got goosebumps because that's exactly it. It's it's. It's getting to a place where they know you're open and interested in mm. whatever it is that they're excited about, right? right? If they know you're there and will celebrate that excitement with them, they want to share. Just like when we get excited about something, we want to share, right? right? We want to share with somebody who'd be interested in it too, because it's exciting and interesting to us. And I love that point about, you know, being in the house with people with, you know, your family that you're that connected with. Yeah. I used to, I would say, and I still say, you know, um, I don't need, uh, uh more relationships. I've got, you know, four right. other people here that I'm so deeply and wonderfully connected with, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that fills me up. You, you know, I don't need to go searching for that elsewhere. Right. Anyway. <laughs> Right. And it, well, and that comes and that really comes with agency, right? It's when you, mm -hmm. when you grant, when you have respect for all and they respect you and that everybody kind of owns controlling themselves and there is no authority, there is no hierarchical authority, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's when everybody is on equal footing. Um, as odd as that may sound to some people who are not quite as far along, it really is, it is that. It really is that. And, and then, you know, people think, oh, do I have to act like a kid? No, mm -hmm. that's not the point at, at all, right? You are still your person. You still have your experience, your life experiences and everything to bring to the table mm -hmm. because that's who you are. It's everybody being um, uniquely themselves and connecting with each other. Right. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, I got to say we went really long, but it was so worth it. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, Terry. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it was. Thank you so much. And before we go, where's the best place for uh, people to connect with you online? Let's see. So I have a blog that I have been sorely um, remiss in keeping up to date of late, <laughs> uh, mainly because I focused on my, uh, exercising too much these days, but I will get back. Um, it is uh, the urbanunschooler.com. Um, so I think it's just urbanunschooler.com. Um, okay. And you can go, there are writings there where I kind of talk about some of these ideas and de-schooling. Um, and then um, I, I can be found on Facebook. Um, I'm not sure if people can search me there, but through many of the different unschooling pages, forums on Facebook, they can find me. And it's okay. T-E-R-I and it's D-E-M-A-R-C-O. And then um, I have an email address, which is T E R I. D E M A R C O six, seven at Gmail. And that will come directly to me as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Terry. Have a great day. Hey, thanks a lot, Pam. Take care. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to pick up your free copy of my book. What is unschooling? In it, we'll explore some of the common questions people have when they first hear about unschooling, like, how will my child learn? How do I know they're learning? What is de-schooling? And how do I get started? It's also available at many online ebook retailers. And if you'd like to connect online, you can find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. 
Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.